Please welcome to the stage Wizards of the Coast lead rules designer for Dungeons and Dragons, Jeremy Crawford. My goodness, there are a lot of you here. <laughs> Welcome to PAX Unplugged. This is a celebration of tabletop gaming, and I have the honor and have had the honor for the last 11 years of working on one of the premier tabletop games, Dungeons and Dragons. I started there at Wizards of the Coast in 2007, uh, was hired on as an editor, very quickly became a rules developer, uh, and now today I serve as the game's lead rules designer and also as the game's managing editor, which is just to say I, I make sure all of our books come together as beautifully as possible. Today, I'm going to take you on a little journey with me. Uh, we're going to go back to when little Jeremy met D&D and we're going to take that journey from then uh, to today uh, with my work on D&D. Because something you may not know about me is that basically D&D and I have grown up together. I was born in 1972 and encountered D&D uh, when I was about six years old. So D&D and I have essentially been strolling along together for my entire life. And if anyone had told the six-year-old Jeremy that someday I'd be on a stage talking about working on this game, I would have said, no, <laughs> no way. So let's talk about little Jeremy encountering D&D on the central coast of California. I grew up in the town of San Luis Obispo. For those of you who don't know, it's a beautiful town right on the middle of the California coast, almost uh, exactly in between San Francisco and Los Angeles. It's a university town, rolling hills with oak trees on them, the ocean nearby. It's a pretty idyllic place. Uh, my parents uh, worked at the university. The first six years of my life, it was just me and my mom. She was a secretary at the university, and we lived in this ramshackle house next to the railroad tracks, and many nights I went to sleep hearing uh, the trains going by. In that time, and I'm sure many of you, if you grew up in the 70s or 80s like I did, there was a tremendous amount of freedom. Uh, when I was a kid, we were often allowed to just explore things on our own, uh, especially later when uh, I was blessed with my step-siblings and then later uh, my brother. During summers, we would often be told in the morning, see you at night for dinner, and I would hop onto a bike and just ride around our town. Uh, discovering all sorts of things on my own. Uh, for example, I discovered my love of comic books uh, by one day going into one of the used bookstores in Phoenix, I mean, I'm sorry, in San Luis Obispo. The bookstore was called Phoenix Books. And they would have these uh, boxes of used comics uh, on the ground in the bookstore. And they would let me, this little kid, just sit there on the floor, rifling through the comics, and that's where I discovered the superhero who is my favorite to this day, and that is Doctor Strange. Uh, and, and so already I was a bit of an unusual kid in that when other kids were grooving on Spider-Man, Superman, etc., I was all about Doctor Strange and the Eye of Agamotto. I couldn't pronounce half the words in the comic book, but by golly was it fascinating. Uh, because at that time, I was fascinated by anything with magic in it. Uh, my favorite TV show was probably Bewitched. Uh, if, yeah, someone's clapping. <laughs> And I loved, I loved stories about wizards and witches so much that in kindergarten, you know how when you're in school you're asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And other people were saying, you know, a firefighter, a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, etc. And they came to me and I said, a witch. <laughs> it, I mean, I, 
it didn't occur to me that the choice had to be practical. Uh, <laughs> They just asked, what did I want to be when I grew up? Uh, I mean, in some ways, now that I'm uh, a wizard at Wizards of the Coast, you can say I actually fulfilled my kindergarten dream. <laughs> in that time of discovering things on our own, my stepsister Amy had this encounter with a game, D&D. One of the other kids in our apartment complex at this time, I was now living with my dad, uh, one of the older kids, I think he was a sixth grader, had discovered this game. And those of you who were around in the 70s and early 80s when D&D was starting to catch on, and then it caught on, and then it caught on more until it was, it was whipping through the culture like wildfire, there was this amazing sense of mystique about it. Because it's very easy for us to forget now that until that time, there had been no game like it. Uh, it was a true cultural phenomenon. And Amy, who was ever exuberant, and she and I have always been alike in just, if we're interested in something, we will just dive headfirst into it. She came to me and said, you've got to try this game. You can do anything you want in it. There's magic. There's dragons, you can get treasure. Now, I had already tuned out the list of things she was telling me. All she had to tell me was, there was magic. Uh, and, and so, I was ready for it. Now, a little bit about Amy. Amy and I uh, were all, all about storytelling. We would take our Star Wars figures, because we also grew up with Star Wars, we would take our Star Wars figures, and in the creek near our apartment, we would build little villages out of mud and sticks, and we would act out elaborate, what today in D&D terms we would refer to as campaigns, of continuing stories of our Star Wars characters, narratives that had nothing to do uh, with the movies. I bring this, this seemingly random detail up just to point out that in sort of my, my story with D&D, my life has always been about coming up with stories, and, and often taking other, taking material that is a bit of inspiration from someplace else and spinning it in new ways. Not only the way many novelists do, screenwriters do, but it's the way all of us as dungeon masters do when we take a published adventure and make it our own, or we make our own adventure and we're inspired by a movie or a comic book or a novel or a video game we've, we've experienced. We're all storytellers in one way or another, and so often that starts when we're children, as it did with me. So I finally got to play D&D, &D. and it was amazing. We all had vorpal swords. <laughs> we truly could do whatever we wanted. And so I want to tell you a bit about my experience of D&D &D at the start. And recently, I had the pleasure of DMing for my niece, Alice, one of my sister Amy's daughters. And Alice is now a D&D player. So Amy is, is doing a fine job of passing on the family tradition to one of her daughters. Uh, and I've experienced with Alice that my childhood of experience of D&D &D back in the 70s uh, is alive and well today with kids playing D&D &D now. So one of the first things I experienced with D&D &D was there are rules. <laughs> Which, I always love bringing this up given the fact that I am now the lead rules designer of D&D. &D. <laughs> but my initial experience of D&D &D was there were no rules. We were little kids. I'm not sure that Reggie, our DM, had ever read a rule book, because at the time, the game was actually still coming out. And also, for those of you who've tried to read the first edition rule books, good luck. <laughs> I say that with all the love, because again, the, those books are, are treasures to me. Uh, you know, they're almost like cozy blankets from my childhood. But even still, when I go back and read them, I'm like, whew, we are, we are lucky this game is still going. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the reason it's still going is because of this amazing seed of inspiration in D&D. 
This seed that whether you understand the rules or not, you can tell stories with your friends, go on amazing high fantasy adventures, and you can build entire worlds. Now later, I did actually read a rule book, and that blew my mind. Uh, rather than feeling like the rules were suddenly constraining what we were doing, luckily, my experience of the rules in that group of people that I was initially playing D&D with was as the rules as a tool. That rather than suddenly there being walls closing in on the stories we wanted to tell, it was like, oh wait, we have a toolbox full of tools that we can take out and use those rules as storytelling inspiration, just as we use movies, books, etc., as inspiration. I bring this up because any of you who follow me on Twitter when I sometimes talk about rules in D&D, I like to bring this, this point up, that the rules are a tool. Uh, they are not here uh, to tell you the correct way to play D&D. What I often like to say is the correct way is, did you have a good time? If the answer is yes, you're playing D&D great. Here's the other thing I experienced. This amazing combination of the social, the visual, the textual, and, and the analytical. Here's what I mean by this. First, it's a game that demands that you talk to your friends. You can't sit there in silence. You have to figure out how to communicate your intentions to each other, not only as players, but then also the DM, uh, especially a child DM, has to learn how to communicate location, description, the motivations of NPCs, how that monster sounds, what that castle looks like. And then when the players disagree, they have to figure out how to resolve those disagreements. And then when there's victory or hilarious defeat, there's that sense of bonding. And so that social element is so powerful in D&D. And again, at the time, in games, there was nothing quite like it. Uh, because D&D was also one of the first co-op games. Uh, you know, there's a like, what? A game where you're not trying to destroy each other? Now, there was an element of that in early D&D in particular, especially if you read play reports of first edition D&D, you would often have people backstabbing each other, uh, at stealing each other's money. Uh, now, part of that is getting money was actually a way to get XP, uh, so there was a powerful rules motivation for, for uh, ripping off your friends. Uh, <laughs> uh, but despite its roots in wargaming, D&D was ultimately about cooperation. D&D is also visual. What I mean here is it's art. The art of D&D has always been a powerful component of its appeal. Think about those early covers, one of which I have up on the screen right now. This was one of my, my first D&D books. Uh, it's funny, I had the Monster Manual first, as many of us did, because the Monster Manual actually came out before the Player's Handbook did. But I didn't get my own Player's Handbook for a, for a while. And so by the time I got my own Player's Handbook, it had the new cover, uh, this beautiful Jeff Easley cover. And actually, just a few weeks ago, uh, at Gamehole Con, I got to finally meet Mr. Easley and tell him that this remains one of my all-time favorite D&D images. Uh, because again, I like, I like magic. Uh, and uh, this is Ringleron, for those of you who used to collect D&D toys. There was actually an action figure of this wizard. Uh, and he was the good wizard, the iconic good wizard of D&D back in first edition. But art like this, along with like the kooky cartoons that were in the first edition uh, core books, like there were like images of adventurers putting on like mouse masks to sneak into a mouse temple. There was a guy holding up his plus one back scratcher. Uh, there was a lot of silliness, uh, but then also a lot of seriousness. And all of that art drew us into fantasy worlds. And it also succeeded in an instant when you saw those paintings, when you saw those line drawings in showing that D&D had many different styles. You would see, as I mentioned, the silly, 
but you would also see the very serious and heroic, like you see on this painting, uh, and everything in between. Deity is textual. It's not only the rules, but also the material about the settings, the material about the adventures, uh, the rules. It draws you in to read, and it draws you in to read closely and then to analyze it. And that's that final bit, the analytical portion. It invites you to analyze what it is you're reading. Not only the rules, but what is this bit of lore I'm reading about Greyhawk, or the Forgotten Realms, or Dragonlance? How might I use it in my own game? How might this inspire my players? So that it had these amazing four components. I've already touched on this very slightly. D&D also, right from the start in my experience, and this continues to this day, supported different styles of play. From the earliest days of D&D, you would have some groups uh, hewing to the game's wargaming roots and playing with miniatures uh, or miniature substitutes, because back then miniatures were not as plentiful as they are today, and they were often expensive and hard to find. Uh, so people would use what they had available, uh, sometimes getting little, little figurines from hobby stores for historical war games and whatnot, and using those at the game table. But Early on, you also had people who would play theater of the mind, who played fast and loose with the rules. You'd have other groups that would stick very closely to the rules. So D&D right away basically invited you to do it your way. Do it the way that your group likes. And that was amazingly powerful for me early on, particularly because I started to get to play with different groups. And I got to see that with each of those groups, the styles were very different. I had some of my buddies from school where our games tended to be uh, a lot of combat, so sort of a hack and slash fest. Occasionally we'd use some miniatures, but then I also had the good fortune of being invited to play in a game DM'd by a young woman at Cal Poly, the university in San Luis Obispo, and that game was just pure storytelling and role playing. And I got to see right there, wow, this game can accommodate all of this. For those of you who have followed the development of 5th edition D&D and have heard me talk about it before, you'll notice that these themes I'm talking about, I often come back to in why we designed 5th edition the way we did. Because in many ways, it goes all the way back to my first experiences of D&D in the 70s and early 80s. And one of the things the team and I agreed on when we began our work on 5th edition D&D was let's recapture that magic that we felt when we first encountered D&D as kids. Because many of us had been with the game uh, since childhood. One thing I found what was true in every group though, regardless of play style, is talk to everything. D&D is a very talky game. And I in particular am a very talky DM and a very talky player. Uh, right from the start as a kid, it's like you show me a growling dragon, I'd be like, wait, 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 Mr. Dragon, sir. Uh, <laughs> or the evil wizard ready to cast a spell at us. Mm, wait, 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 I have a quick question. Uh, <laughs> Or, and this happens even to this day in my home game, uh, I love talk in world so much that in many ways sometimes I can be far too, far too accommodating as a DM. And so if the players go into the store and they want to talk to the shopkeeper, cue 15-minute shopping montage. <laughs> And suddenly the shopkeeper, who never existed in my notes, now has a name, I'm developing a backstory, they're going to be a recurring NPC. <laughs> but again, I think you'll find that even if your group is really into miniatures play, there's still this element of talk. It's powerful. D&D also, and this was the thing, more than any of these other elements for me, really captured me. And that is, D&D, in the cosmos that it presents, has a place for everything. And I mean literally everything. In the first edition player's handbook, toward the back of the book, there was this page, page 121, it's my favorite page in the first edition player's handbook, that shows a map of the D&D multiverse. 
And this map shows the prime material plane, which you learn in the first edition books, contains all of the different worlds that you can imagine. It's even hinted that our world is on that plane. Now, there are different accounts. Sometimes in the early books, the prime material plane is referred to as a single plane. Sometimes it's referred to as a set of parallel planes. But the the message is the same, whichever one of those routes you go, that there is this realm of existence where all worlds that you can imagine, the Forgotten Realms, Eberron, Dragonlance, Dark Sun, etc., there's a place for them. But it gets even better. That they are also tied to the realms of myth, the elemental planes, a plane of pure darkness, a plane of pure light, all of the realms of the gods, whether they are gods of good or evil, of, bede- of benevolent or malevolent intent, realms lifted from most of our world's myth systems, sometimes done in uh, very reductive ways, but I was a kid, uh, and it was only later in my life that I would start truly digging into the myth systems that inspired D&D. But what captured my imagination is that those Greek myths that I found so fascinating as a kid, those Norse myths, the, the Elric books that I was reading, even those were in the original uh, Deities and Demigods for D&D, uh, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in the first edition Deities and Demigods book, uh, the Cthulhu mythos was actually in that book. Uh, it was later removed from the book. Uh, but again, there was a place for everything. The original uh, uh, Dungeon Master's Guide also had rules for firearms, for having a Western-style campaign, for having a science fiction-style campaign. The message in D&D was, as long as it's some kind of fantasy or science fiction fantasy, you can tell that sort of story in this game. So not only was that inspiring to a kid who loved to tell stories, but it was also inspiring because it suggested and here I'm going to get a little woo-woo, it, it suggested also more broadly a, con- a connectivity between everything. And this, for me as a young man, started to become a theme. Uh, but before I could explore that further, my mind got blown by the rise of narrative in D&D. Because even though in my groups we love to tell stories, for those of you who saw first edition adventures know that in many of them, there is barely a whiff of narrative. Many of them are locations, essentially stages set for you to tell your own story in. Now, I actually love that because it was an invitation. Many of those early adventures invited us to step in and make a story up. Like, if you have ever played Keep on the Borderlands, you will know there's really not a big plot there. But if you are industrious, you can make all sorts of plots, all sorts of NPCs. You can tell stories in those locations for months if you want to. But TSR did something amazing uh, when, in 1983, they released Ravenloft, which to this day is my favorite D&D adventure. 83 was also around when Return of the Jedi came out. So an interesting... Uh, confluence where we also learned in the third Star Wars movie that you could have this epic storytelling in a science fantasy movie. Uh, So that was a powerful thing for, for me to see as a kid. Now, Ravenloft was special in the history of D&D because one, it had a fleshed out villain, Count Strahd von Zarovich. That might It might seem like a strange thing for me to point out as significant. A fleshed out villain, didn't all the D&D adventures have one? No, they didn't. Uh, Most of them, what stood in for villains were, there were five bugbears in the room. There were three goblins in the room across the hall. And they very politely waited in their rooms for you to come in and kill them. <laughs> that, 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 that was, in a lot of the early adventures, what stood in for uh, villain creation. Now, we did have some examples uh, in the village of Hamlet, in the Moat House, 
we saw the seeds of villain creation, uh, and we also saw a lot of great NPCs. But what was interesting is even though a lot of those early D&D adventures had villains, had interesting NPCs, there wasn't much effort done to tie them together in a cohesive story. Ravenloft was the adventure that did just that. Took this villain, this vampire, and made the entire adventure about interacting with him and opposing or potentially cooperating with his dark designs. It also was amazing in that Castle Ravenloft and the village of Barovia felt like lived-in places. A lot of the early maps uh, for D&D looked like game maps. Most of them, and I know this because I'm married to an architect who early on when I introduced him to D&D would endlessly complain about how none of these buildings were possible. Because uh, <laughs> uh, he would sit there looking at the wall thickness and say this building would collapse. Uh, <laughs> And, and, if you, and this is true, especially a lot of the, of the earliest dungeon maps, that they were not designed uh, to have any kind of believability as architecture. They were designed as a place to have adventures in. In Ravenloft, you started to have places that actually started to feel like an actual place. Uh, if you look at the map of Castle Ravenloft, you can actually imagine people living there. There are kitchens. It even looks like there might be a place for somebody to go to the bathroom. Now, I will say though, that even that map, and this was brought up to me again when we reproduced the map in Curse of Strahd for fifth edition, my, my, my husband pointed out yet again, even Castle Ravenloft would collapse. <laughs> Which, and it's funny, it's funny uh, how, how some things work their way into our books. It is actually why in Curse of Strahd, ooh, I'm about to pull this tablecloth off. Uh, it's why in Curse of Strahd, I actually put in a note that the castle was specifically built with magic. <laughs> and so if any of you, If any, of you, if any of you have seen that in the book, just know I put that there simply as a note to my husband, Philip, <laughs> this is why it hasn't collapsed. <laughs> Ravenloft is also remarkable for its do-it-yourself quality. This adventure introduced this amazing conceit of drawing cards and your card draw determining elements of the plot, which meant you could actually play this adventure more than once. Now these days, it feels very strange to think about playing an adventure more than once, particularly because D&D adventures today are so plot-driven. Uh, and so actually one of the positive sides of having a more open-ended sandbox style of adventure is you can actually play them more than once. Because of this element in Ravenloft, many of us grew up playing this adventure over and over again. And in my group of friends, we had an annual tradition for a while of playing it every Halloween. And I would DM it each year and I would change things, figure out ways I could shorten it. And we would actually get through the main elements of the adventure in a four hour session. Now you think of Curse of Strahd and it's like, oh my God, impossible. Uh, but it actually, it could be done. Uh, but this do-it-yourself element we take for granted now in adventure design, but it's largely inspired by Ravenloft, and it's something that in our adventure design today at Wizards of the Coast, we still emulate. Here's another thing that happened. The very next year, Dragonlance, Dragons of Despair came out. These two adventures were the most influential on me as a future game designer because of how they integrated in place, NPC, villains, and story. They also both happened to be written by Tracy Hickman and uh, Laura Hickman. Uh, so I've told Tracy before that in many ways, he's, he is as responsible as Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson for stoking uh, my love for D&D. And then later when I met Laura, I was able to tell her the same. Dragons of Despair, for those of you who don't know, actually came out before the Dragonlance novels. And so 
my experience of Dragonlance is actually very different from many other people's. Many other people think of Dragonlance first as a world for novels and then a, a world to play in. For me, we started playing in it before the novels were out, uh, which meant we felt like, oh my God, there is this amazing epic story that we get to participate in. And so these two together also showed the amazing stylistic range of D&D. One is gothic horror, and the other one is romantic high fantasy, which, by the way, are actually my two favorite forms of fantasy. So this was at a particularly powerful time for me as a young D&D fan. Uh, and to this day, you'll also notice that they're in D&D, partly because these are my two favorite styles, and they happen to also be two of the favorite styles of Chris Perkins. The two of us tend to then make, make a lot of epic high fantasy and gothic horror in fifth edition material. This was also for me a golden age of gaming. Second edition came out. Second edition for me was magical because for the first time, the rules were intelligible. Uh, <laughs> the second edition uh, and, and uh, Zeb Cook and Steve Winter, uh, I, I've told Steve Winter this many times before. For me, one of their great accomplishments was to show that you could have this amazing open-ended game and have rules that a person could read from beginning to end and actually play the game using those rules. Uh, second edition also brought an explosion in the player base and also an amazing prolif pro proliferation, let's see if I can say that word, uh, of worlds in the D&D multiverse. I also at this time began to play other RPGs. My favorite by far was Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, uh, which which had this, this sort of horror element in it uh, that I love, uh, but also at the time I was starting to get into the Warhammer miniatures game, and so this started to expand my gaming horizons. I also played a ton of Marvel superheroes uh, and many other games. I mentioned I got into miniatures gaming, and also I got to meet Dave Arneson at this time. In San Luis Obispo, there was a little game convention called Polycon that I went to each year. It's at Cal Poly, the university there. And one year, Dave Arneson was a guest. And I sat there eating up every word he said. And at the end, there was a Q&A period. And I asked Dave, well, just what advice do you have for us young dungeon masters? And Dave at the time was actually really concerned about the game continuing to grow. And so what he said to me is just to keep inviting people to play D&D &D and try to make it to anyone that you invite in, try to make it as inviting as possible. That is something I've taken to heart to this day. It's one of the reasons why in fifth edition, we tried to make the rules as lean as possible so that the barriers to entry would be as low as possible. It's why we released the core rules for the game for free. Uh, we even just recently, within the last week, uh, released a new version of the basic rules, uh, united into one big PDF, so that anyone can download our game and play it for free. I also, in the same time span, got to spend an entire day with Gary Gygax. In our, in our town, we had a game store called Games People Play, and I worked there. It was really just the owner and me. Uh, we were the only two people who worked in this store. Uh, I did everything, you know, stocked the shelves, dusted the shelves, helped people, explained games, then even played games at the store, had sort of my first taste of the kind of things we sometimes now do in the D&D Adventurers League uh, with the open where, you know, the actions of one table might affect another, where in, in the store we would have, we had two tables next to each other and the thing happening in one table might affect what was going on in the other. There was a lot of experimentation that went on in this time. Our little store, we invited Gary to come, not sure that he would actually do it, and he did. He came for an entire day, we flew him out to do a book signing for people to chat with him, and the amazing job I got was just to be his attendant, make sure he had water when he needed it, if he was hungry, got him food, but mostly it meant I got to spend the day next to him just chit-chatting with him. 
Now, I was, as you can imagine, kind of horrified and, and, like, and delighted at the same time. I remember talking to him a bit about Temple of Elemental Evil because I had excitedly been reading through it and had started running it. I just talked about how much I loved the game. My main memory of Gary was that he was completely down to earth with me, endlessly warm. His, his mood toward me all day long was grandfatherly. And at the end of the day, and the reason why I have up on the screen my Dungeon Master's Guide, is at the end of the day, he signed it, and to, and to this day, it is one of my most treasured possessions. Uh, inside it, he wrote, thank you so much for being such a good host to me. Uh, and I view it now as one of my jobs to be a hospitable host for anyone who wants to come to the D&D table, but also to be a faithful steward to the game that these men that I had the fortune of meeting all those years ago, that they imagined, and that they did the amazing labor to create, and that many others after them have, have developed. Because one of the amazing things about this game, which is appropriate given how social it is, is many, many people have contributed to it, to its success, to our love of it. School. I get asked sometimes, Jeremy, what did you do to get ready to become a game designer? Well, clearly I wore a Skywalker Ranch t-shirt at some point. <laughs> and that is my mom, who was the biggest supporter of the adults in my life of my D&D play. She happily hosted my D&D group at times every Saturday at our house. We would play in the kitchen or we would play on our back patio. It being California, we could play outside and it, was, and it was comfortable. But she was always amazingly supportive. I want to pause here because you probably have noticed that one of the through lines in my D&D experience is women. I never experienced what sadly so many other people did, that this was a game just for boys. I actually had to learn that from other people. It was later when I went off to college and saw D&D groups that didn't have girls or women in them. I was like, what is going on? Uh, because for me growing up, it really was this game for everyone. And so that, again, is something that I have taken to heart and tried to make a reality in 5th edition of that experience that I had as a kid of this is a game for people of all types. Make sure people actually feel that in our books, in how we talk about the game, how we talk to you, and how we listen. <laughs> So I did a lot of acting when I was in school, both in high school and in college. I also did a lot of editing. Uh, in some ways, without knowing it, I was preparing for many of the skills I would need later working on D&D. In high school, I was one of the yearbook editors, and then in college, uh, for a time, I was the managing editor of the college newspaper. I loved text. Uh, I loved delving into it, polishing it, making it read better. I was also a super nerd and was a triple major in college. I majored in English literature, philosophy, and theology. Uh, I, I couldn't make up my mind. Uh, and also, this goes back to that theme of, remember one of the things that drew me to D&D is this idea of everything being connected? Well, I, it's why in a way I couldn't choose, so I just decided I'll do all of it. Now, my final year in college, I actually shed two of the majors because suddenly reality smacked me in the face, and I was like, uh, this will add a year or two if I actually graduate with all three. So I ended up graduating with my bachelor's degree in English Lit. But for most of the time, I was studying just as much philosophy and theology as I was literature. Then I went off to seminary. Some of you might not know this about me. For a time, I was a cleric. <laughs> Before I multi-classed into wizard later. 
in seminary, I went to St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary in New York. My goal was to become a theology professor. I was studying beside people who were preparing for the priesthood, but there were also those of us in the seminary preparing for lives as academics. Uh, my best friend in seminary, actually, she went on to be a doctor. Uh, she's a psychiatrist now, uh, but wanted uh, the education that our seminary provided. One of the things that I carry with me to this day from seminary is this notion of text as a life tool. You're probably wondering what the heck does Jeremy mean by this. What I mean is a big part of our work in seminary, studying sacred texts, is really taking text seriously. Not to be bound by it, but to, be, but to understand it. And to understand it ourselves. Because there is such an amazing power when you tune out what everyone else is telling you about a piece of writing and you encounter it yourself. What does this text say to me? What is meaningful to me? What power does it have for me? This principle is important not only for something like sacred texts uh, or literature or political writing, but it is also important actually in something as uh, less serious as D&D or any other game you might play. I so often love to point people to our rule books for D&D, and you'll see me do this on Twitter. And I get asked sometimes, I'm like, Jeremy, are you getting frustrated? Is that why you're basically telling people to RTFM? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, what I often point out is, no, I'm doing it because I think going to the book yourself is so powerful, because then there's no barrier between you and this thing you care about. You're encountering it yourself, you're making up your mind yourself, and then you can also have an informed discussion with your friends about it. It's, a, it's a, about me empowering you. That's why I say, open up that book. Uh, because in the end, I don't want you to rely on me or anyone else. I want you to have a sense of confidence in yourself that you've got the tools you need and then if there's something in there that confuses you, you can ask me, you can ask a friend. But the point is, you've got that power. I then went on also to do translation work while I was in seminary. I studied ancient Greek and dug deep, deep into the text. I also then went on to start a PhD. And my focus was going to be on the poet William Blake. Uh, not only I loved his mythological work, but also I loved the marriage in his work of art and text. For those of you who don't know, Blake was a painter just as much as he was a poet. It's a shame that many people who read Blake in school only see his poems. It's usually Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Uh, you only see it just the text on its own. But he was a painter and presented all of his writing in visual form. It's almost, you could almost imagine it uh, being like a graphic novel. And again, this is a, a, a recurring theme for me. I love that marriage of the visual and the textual. And so that's why I delved into Blake. I didn't end up finishing my PhD though, because I, I met 21 years ago the man I'm married to now, and he needed to finish school, and so I ended up leaving my PhD program to work to put him through school, and I just ended up never going back. Uh, so instead, what I ended up doing, my, which, which I refer to as my life in the world, is I started doing book editing. Uh, I even did a period where I was editing computer books. Uh, there is, if, if you work it all in Linux, there is a Linux book called Linux Complete, where if you look in the credits, I am the editor of that book. Uh, I also then went on from my editing of computer books and history books to web development. I decided, going back to the theme as a kid of if I'm, if I'm interested in something, dive head in. I was like, the web was a thing. I want to do that thing. And so I taught myself not only HTML, but also Perl scripting and later PHP. And for a while, I made a career of it. I was eventually the web director at California College of the Arts. I loved my work there. I loved helping to teach students web design there. But I knew I wanted to get back to storytelling. 
And so I reached out to my friend Aaron Loeb, who I knew had been doing some writing, and he put me in contact with the folks at Green Ronin Publishing. Around this time, third edition had come out, and then 3.5 had come out, and they gave me my first RPG credit. And that is, if I can get this, The Book of Fiends, which I love this, this juxtaposition. The previous slide was me in my seminary robe. <laughs> and here's a book of demons. Uh, so my job on the 3.5 version of the Book of Fiends was to convert every single stat block in that book from its 3.0 version to its 3.5 version. This was an amazing baptism of fire. <laughs> Uh, pun intended, uh, I should say pun, uh, baptism of hellfire, uh, because what it forced me to do was to master third edition. Uh, I needed to know every nuance if I was going to get these stat blocks right. And I, I went overboard. I, th I think they were, even, uh, they were uh, amazed at the, the uh, uh, meticulousness of my work, but sometimes people have joked of me that with me, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. <laughs> then I went on from there, and this is all moonlighting, by the way. I'm still the web director at California College of the Arts, so in my evenings, I then, with my friend Steve Kenson, co-designed the RPG Blue Rose. I have some people who like Blue Rose down here. And Blue Rose also just recently uh, got a second edition. Blue Rose is a romantic fantasy game uh, that is really all about that talking I love, but also about a type of fantasy uh, that is really powerfully about connection. Uh, romantic connection, social connection, uh, and about fighting injustice. I then went on to do some writing in uh, the second edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. That book has a chapter on gods. I also uh, worked up the pantheon for the world of Aldea, which is Blue Rose's world, so then went on to work on the pantheon uh, in the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay book. Uh, I, again, I get to say this is in a way uh, that I get to use my seminary education. Um, I, by the way, then later, when working on fourth edition, helped flesh out and finalize the pantheon of gods in fourth edition. Uh, so this is a recurring theme for me. Uh, also did some writing for mutants and masterminds. Then all of that work, and I'm trying, starting to speed up because we only have 10 minutes left, uh, <laughs> I became a wizard. Uh, I was hired at Wizards of the Coast uh, and saw the end of third edition. I worked on the very last book of third edition, The City of Stormreach, and then immediately jumped from there to the start of fourth edition. I was one of the two editors of the fourth edition player's handbook, and that title is a little misleading because at the time in the D&D department, editor didn't just mean, oh, people who make sure all the commas are in place. The editors were actually the people who finished the book, uh, making sure all the pieces were there, uh, that everything was internally consistent, uh, that all the game mechanics actually made sense. And so one of the things I did right before the fourth edition player's handbook went out into the world was complete the combat system. It, it arrived on my desk in a skeletal form. I fleshed that out so that uh, it, it worked like a well-oiled machine. I then went on to work on book after book after book, feet, power, etc. of fourth edition through the life of that edition. Learning a tremendous amount, not only about D&D, &D, but also about rules design. Over the course of that time, I wrote the rules compendium for fourth edition. Uh, and it was in this period of D&D, &D, the third and fourth edition era, that really the rules reigned. They were king. Because part of the third and fourth edition project was an exploration to see, could we make it so that the rules answer all of your adjudication questions? Now, any of us who've DM'd for a while know ultimately the answer is no. Uh, because too many corner cases come up in a game as wild and wooly as D&D. &D. But we certainly made an attempt uh, in third and fourth edition. Uh, there are three things that I took with me from my work on fourth. 
that inform my rules design now on fifth. Making rules as clear as possible, structuring the game in a way that is accessible and understandable, and making sure the style of the game is what people actually want. Now, in fourth, the style was really role-playing game married to tactical miniatures play. I put it that way because sometimes fourth gets reduced by some people to saying, oh, it's just a miniatures game. Many of us who play fourth know that's not true. We told wonderful stories in fourth edition, but it was a storytelling game married to miniatures play. And I think fourth did an amazing job of expressing that style of D&D. And so from that standpoint, it did its job when it comes to rules design. But here's the thing. We discovered D&D players wanted more than that. D&D players wanted more styles than that. Remember how earlier in the presentation I said one of my earliest discoveries with D&D is people have different play styles. And so that discovery led us to realize we need to work, do work to expand D&D. That led us to the D&D Next project where we wanted to explore with all of you and the thousands and thousands of people around the world who have loved D&D for decades, what is it you want from Dungeons and & Dragons? And so for us, that period uh, was a lot about listening. For us to shut up for a while and let you tell us, what do you want? What do you love about D&D? But it was also a chance for us to listen to ourselves. What do we love about D&D? It was really in this period, actually, that I thought back through my own life with D&D and began to realize there's a lot I could do in designing this game with our team to make it closer to the game I've always loved. Part of that, and I skipped past it, uh, is also making text and art one in our process and in how we present the books. One thing that's special about fifth edition books that you might not know is every book is bespoke. Each one is custom. In the previous editions, what would happen is the D&D team would write up the book, we'd hand it over to another department, they would lay it out, send it back to us to approve or not. There would be some back and forth, but that was about it. Now, for fifth edition, every book is designed in its entirety. Layout, typography, rules design, writing, editing, art, all by the Dungeons & Dragons team. And even more than that, it's designed usually by just three people. Each of the books, in the end, end up in the hands of myself, Kate Irwin, our art director, and Emmy Tanji, our graphic designer. Now, we've recently hired another graphic designer, Trish Yoakum, and often on many of our books, the, our, our little group, we refer to ourselves as Voltron because we, we combine together uh, to, to make each D&D book. Uh, for many of them, we're then also joined by Chris Perkins. And we, as a collective, decide where each piece of art goes, uh, commission each of piece of art to make sure it expresses the feel that we want. Uh, because as the managing editor of the game, even though text is ultimately my responsibility, I think art in D&D is just as important, and in some cases more important, because art is the first thing you see. And what I often say is, if we, if we whiff it on a bit of text, it's painful, but we can recover. But if we whiff it on the art, people aren't even going to show up. Uh, and so for me, the work of Kate and Emmy and Trish is just as important to the success of 5th edition as anything any of our game designers have done. And it's why I take so seriously even like the fonts we use, how do the pages look, wanting every bit of your D&D experience with our books uh, to draw you into a fantasy world and inspire you to tell stories of your own. We then launched 5th edition, and to our surprise, it was way more successful than we expected. We 
based on the playtest, which had over 175,000 playtesters, we thought there's a good chance 5th edition is going to do well, but we didn't know for sure. So it blew us away when the game came out and did well, and we're like, okay, it's, it's going well, it's going well, but we steeled ourselves for the decline because every edition has had a peak of sales when it first comes out, and then it starts to decline. Except we got to years two and three for fifth edition, and instead, after a very brief, tiny decline, it then started to go up and up and up. And so fifth edition is the first edition of the game that has actually increased in sales over its lifespan rather than decreasing. I think a big part of that is that you all were a part of creating it. I think we did this basically as one giant adventuring party. Sure, I oversaw the creation of the books, but the work that I and the rest of the team did wouldn't have been possible with us turning to the other members of our party and saying, so should we go in that door or that door? And do we want to touch that altar, or should we maybe toss something at it before we go up? Your feedback was critical in us creating a Dungeons & Dragons that blew the doors open so that as many people as possible could feel like they could come in and play at the table. A personal note. The same year we launched 4th edition, that's also the year Philip and I got married. Uh, So it was both a crazy stressful year, but also the happiest year of my life. D&D is really ultimately about connection. This is something I have touched on both directly and indirectly throughout this talk. I'm convinced that one of the reasons this game has held on for over 40 years, and I hope that it will hold on for another 40, and another 40 after that, and another 40 after that, is that it gives us a sense of connection to each other, to stories, to big mythological ideas, to small, hilarious ideas. It goes across the entire spectrum. And D&D has a place for all of it. J.R.R. Tolkien, in his essay on fairy stories, said that one of the reasons why fantasy, not just D&D, but fantasy, is so powerful, and the reason why it spans all human cultures, is that it speaks to a need that we have to feel connected to the world around us. Think about how in fantasy, there are these tropes of talking to animals, or whispering to the fire and it responds, of uttering the right words and the mountain itself answers your call, of being able to travel up into the sky and speak to gods face to face, of being so much of a master of your own body that you are the finest warrior in the world, where you're connected to yourself, all of that is about feeling this sense of union with everything around us and with each other. And we play that out in the simplest ways every time we play D&D. When we laugh together, when we roll the dice together, when we gasp at the absurd thing that just happened at the table. In all those moments, we are creating worlds together and also expressing our desire to be ever connected, and ever connected in deeper ways with the world around us and with each other. Thank you very much, everyone.